You're, You're listening to the Project Ignite podcast, where real digital entrepreneurs reveal their very best tips, tools, and strategies to help you ignite and grow your online business. ProjectIgnite.com. Your digital business starts here. Now, here's your host, Derek Gale. Welcome to the Project Ignite podcast, a podcast designed to skip the hype, skip all the BS and give you real actual tips and strategies from experts that are actually doing this stuff uh, so you can actually apply it and help grow your business. This is your host, Derek Yale. Today, we're going to be diving deep into uh, a very interesting topic um, in uh, related to uh, subcategories. And that's going to make more sense here in a moment, uh, but as a way to really differentiate and grow your business in this digital age. And uh, today's guest to help us explore this topic, uh, he's the vice chairman of profit and he's uh, professor, <laughs> professor Emeritus of Marketing Strategy at the Berkeley Haas School of Business, uh, is the winner of a five career awards for contribution to the practice of science of marketing that include being named to the NYAMA Marketing Hall of Fame and uh, receiving the Sheth Foundation Medal. Uh, God, he's published over 100 articles, 17 books that have sold over a million copies, uh, including strategic market management, building strong brands, brand leadership, brand portfolio strategy, um, from Fargo to the world of brands, spanning silos, brand relevance. You're probably starting to see a bit of a theme here. Uh, Acre on branding, <laughs> creating signature stores, and his latest book, uh, which is going to be kind of the top of our conversation today, and that is owning game-changing subcategories. Uh, I mean, uh, to say the least, he's recognized as an authority on branding. He's been an active consultant, speaker throughout the world. Uh, without further ado, I'm honored to welcome David Aker to the show. David, so much. Thank you so much for being here today. Yeah, I'm glad to be here. Thanks for having me. For sure. Okay. So look, um, you know, we were talking before this and, and, and before I hit record and we were getting into some really interesting topics. Um, uh, let's dive in, but I want to start kind of at the beginning here uh, for our listeners, because your, uh, your most recent book, uh, which was Owning Game-Changing Subcategories, I found that really fascinating. And I think it's a, a, a very powerful lesson for anyone uh, getting into business uh, and growing a business. So to start with, can you just start by explaining what you mean by subcategories? What is a subcategory in your definition in a book, in the book? Well, I, it started off with my uh, examination of some beer data in Japan, and I realized over a 30-year period, there was only four occasions in which there was really any meaningful change in, in market share. And all these could be explained by the development of a whole new subcategory, like Asahi Dry Beer. And uh, then I looked at computers, and, uh, and I found the same thing. Every time you see a surge in Dell or, or Apple or something, it was always a new subcategory. And, what, and I looked at a dozen other uh, areas and, and found the same thing. So by a subcategory, I mean a, an offering that uh, is, is, uh, really has a, a, must ha a set of must-haves, really. And a must-have is either a... Uh, uh, it's a, it, it's a something new or something greatly improved that changes either the buying or the use experience. So it's something new that means that you're really buying something different or using something different, but in, in within the same larger category. And uh, the uh, you know one of the reasons that this book differs from the many other books on on uh, innovation and disruption is that uh, it, it, it makes the, the uh, it really extends it to subcategories and not just, uh, just new categories like Cirque du Soleil uh, that was done in the Blue Ocean book. And uh, because for every new category that gets formed, at least 15 subcategories are being formed. There's a lot more opportunity to think at the subcategory level. The other thing that's different about my book on innovation is uh, the fact that, that I recognize the importance of branding. These other books, you can look on the index under B, there's nothing under branding. It's like branding doesn't exist. But what I've observed is if you want to be success in this disruptive innovation space, uh, 
You need to own the game-changing subcategories, and you do that by branding. You create what I call an exemplar brand, the mm -hmm. brand that represents that subcategory. And that exemplar brand has three jobs. One is to position the subcategory. So you're in an unfamiliar position of branding and building the brand of a subcategory and not just your little private operation. Second, it has to scale the subcategory because especially today, you need to scale these suckers fast in mm -hmm. order to, to really own them. And the third job of the exemplar brand is to create barriers to competition. And so you, uh, if, you, if you position it such that you own the position, that's one barrier. It, and, and if it's a strong position, and if you grow fast, you own the, another barrier, that's in the that's customer base, you own the best customers already, that's the early customers. And, but there are others, you can brand the innovation. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, like Uniqlo has heat tech uh, fabric. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that becomes a must have. It's only a, a, a available at Uniqlo, the, the Japanese clothing retailer. Mm -hmm. And uh, so uh, that's a, a, another route to that. And another route is you can just continuously innovate like Prius did with their hybrid. And, uh, and so you become a moving target. So anyway, that, that's the, uh, the essence of my take on disruptive innovation and uh, that you need to have uh, a set of must-haves that define a whole new subcategory, you change what people buy, they, they will insist on having that, which others don't have. And, uh, and then you become the exemplar brand and it positions scale and build barriers. So why, why a subcategory and not striving to create a category? Well, as I said, the, the Blue Ocean book, it, just to take one out of 100, mm -hmm. um, they talk about really inventing new categories. And they, the Circus Soleil is a whole new way of, of presenting a circus. Yeah. And, uh, and that just doesn't happen very often. No. And there's not very many people can pull that off. But when you come to a, uh, uh, a, a normal category, like uh, like shaving, for example, I mean there there's you could say there was only one a new category formed in the whole last um, uh, hundred years. That was the electric shaver. Mm -hmm. But if you look at the Dollar Shave Club, which is one of the examples I use, I mean they created a new subcategory. It was one that you got through the mail. It was one that was very simple, only three choices you had to make, not like the 12,000 at Amazon. And, uh, and they have a, a breathtaking low price if, if you compare it to buying at your local drugstore. And it's very simple and convenient. So they created four or five must-haves. They're very funny, irre irreverent brand. And uh, so they created these four or five uh, sub, uh, uh, must haves that define a whole new subcategory, but it's still razors. Yeah. I mean, they didn't. Uh, um, so, you know, if you want to wait another 50 years for the next electric razor, good luck. But, but Dollar Shave Club can jump in and create a subcategory without really doing, um, you know, much in the way of, of classic uh, uh, technical innovation. So, and, and that's interesting um, that you use the Dollar Shave Club because I think a lot of people, when you say, okay, you need to create something unique, they look at their product and go, how do I differentiate this product, right? How do I make my blade sharper or uh, better or heated or, or whatever? Effectively, their product was the, the same as, or and some people would probably argue inferior to, you know, the standard Gillette, but they created their must-have by looking outside and how they packaged and present it. And so well they have they have at least five must haves. And and okay. every successful innovation I've looked at has multiple ones. It's very rare you just have a single one. Okay. Okay. But they have this relationship with their customer, their personality. It's 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 very uh uh outrageously funny yeah. and irreverent they they ridicule gillette they ridicule the drugstore yeah and you, you know most uh, gillette can't do that uh, yeah and uh, cbs can't do that 
they can't be funny and irreverent. And uh, and then they uh, they created this uh, this. They were a pioneer in e-commerce in this category. Yeah. They were a pioneer in subscription uh, uh, things. And uh, and they and like uh, most of the successful e-commerce, they're they're simple. Literally, Amazon has twelve thousand options. Mm-hmm. Not kidding. Twelve thousand. Dollar Shave Club has three. Yeah. Now, where would where would it be more fun to buy? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, for sure. Less frustrating. Yeah. And you know, if you go to a drugstore, you have to go to a lock case. You have oh. to find the manager to open Girl. up the lock case. Yeah. And then you open up the lock case. You have no idea which one you're supposed to buy because you know there's there's <laughs> 12 razors there and they don't know you don't know which one. Yeah, sure. That yeah. matches yours. Yeah. Yeah. All right. So uh, now out of those must haves that you're identifying there, is any one more important? Is there any one kind of must have that is, is more important than another must have? Like we talk about, say, yeah, I think, I think that gets into positioning. And and in my, my take on brands is that a brand is more than a three word phrase. It's multidimensional. Okay. But then within that, if you have eight, 10, 12 dimensions, you have to pick out the three to five that are most important. And then you have to pick out the two or three, maybe that you want to position the brand for a particular audience. And so, uh, yeah, you do have to, um, you, you do have to worry about that. But like in the case of the, of the uh, uh, Dollar Shave Club, you, you have this irreverent, funny personality that's kind of in the background. Mm-hmm. So, uh, so they can position against the, the uh, inconvenience of the uh, drugstore and the, and the lack of a, a simple uh, choice that's based on the credibility they have with, in the industry. Mm-hmm. Uh, Dollar Shave Club, not that me, I mean. And uh, so they can position against those two things. And then the, the, uh, the personality kind of exists in the background. Sure. They don't have to come on and say, you know, you're going to like us because we're, we're irreverent and funny. Yeah. Yeah. So, okay. So let's talk about this as it relates to the current online slash e-commerce environment, because, you know, we, you talk about the blue ocean strategy categories are, are hard to create. And we're uh, really at a time and place on the internet where there's just some really big entrenched players that knocking them off. You're not going to be the next Amazon, right? Like I just a general commerce platform. I don't see anybody taking them on. So who would you say is doing this well right now online? If you were going to say, Hey, here's some great examples of e-commerce that have created subcategories um, and have taken business away from Amazon who are they? Well, I think first it's, it's, it's useful to look at the Amazon strengths and weaknesses. Okay. Because that's the environment you're walking into. Yeah. And Amazon at first blush seems invincible. They have this enormous product scope, whatever size, whatever color they have it. Mm-hmm. They have amazing operational uh, excellence. You know, the one day delivery, the one click, the personalization and customer reviews. They have low prices that comes from their scale economies and and integrated uh, vertical integration, but it also comes from the fact they're subsidizing their business with their cloud business. Yeah. And and then they got Prime, which is sort of the ultimate sledgehammer. So they they really look invincible. But if you look at them uh, from a a distance, you, you see some weaknesses. First of all, they're 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 such a have such a functional focus. Yeah. I mean, uh, their visible robots kind of represent Amazon. Mm-hmm. And and the second thing and related is that you know they have a horrible personality. Yeah. Horrible, ag- uh, arrogant. Use yeah. Amazons and uh, robots instead of people. They're not fun. They're not funny. 
who would like a relationship with a person like that? And the third thing is they try to be all things to all people. So they really don't have any content credibility anywhere. They don't have any passion, any heart for anything. So those, those are some of their weaknesses. And so if you look at that, uh, one thing you can do is establish credibility for the subcategory. Mm-hmm. You know, there's Everlane makes t-shirts. And, you know, that's a pretty basic commodity, but they, they have transparent pricing. They tell you the costs. They have uh, uh, ethical production. They will give you pictures in, of the factory so you know where the things are made. You know, it's mm-hmm. not made, made by slave labor. Amazon can't do that. Yeah. Uh, they, uh, if you look at Warby Parker, they've got, their, they've got in-house design. They design their own glasses. You yep. go to Amazon and you can buy sunglasses. You don't know who the hell designed them. There's no, there's no magic there. So c- credibility is one thing. Another is the simpler uh, choice set. I already talked about Dollar Shave Club offers you three. Amazon offers you 12,000 ra- razors. So, and that comes out of credibility. They couldn't do that unless they had developed credibility. And then there's a brand community which is a very powerful thing. It's a gathering of people that share your interests and passion. You look at Este, for example, the, the, the really upscale craft uh, oh, yeah. nature site yeah, that, yeah, that yeah, sure. draws people that are interested in crafts. They have a community, yeah. a community of makers and a community of buyers that really have a passion for this stuff. Amazon really, it's really interesting. Amazon developed a, a clone of Etsy. And they try to create their own brand community. Didn't work. Mm-hmm. Amazon just didn't have the heart. It didn't have the passion. It was transactional. But they, they tried to develop a brand community. I mean, when you say heart, what are you referring to? Like, how, how do you define that? How do you say this is the heart that Etsy has that Amazon didn't? A heart is something that, that provides, um, well, if you have a product that, uh, that generates or a brand that generates self-expressive benefits, it means that it really expresses who you are. And it's really a part of your life. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it gives meaning to your life. It reflects what you think is important, your values, your, your interests, your activities, how you spend your time, uh, what you care about. Sure. Uh, and and that's, that's what I mean by heart. It's, uh, it's kind of all those things. And so, you know, if you think about Safeway, which is a wonderful uh, company that distributes food very efficiently, and it's a pleasure to be in there it's easy to shop and mm-hmm. and they have great stuff and uh, uh but it, but you compare that to well you compare it to whole foods or you compare it to uh a, a gourmet cooking for example uh some of the gourmet fo- cooking sites they treat people that have a passion for cooking a passion for food yeah. they really care if it's organic and everything Safeway doesn't care because mm-hmm. Safeway has no passion for food. Safeway has, has a passion for warehousing, for trucking, for, uh, for pricing, for displaying merchandise. They don't really have a passion for food. I mean, they're not run by people that, are, um, that love to cook and love to entertain. Yeah, you know, it's, it's funny as I listen to you talk, I'm thinking through a lot of the sites when I don't buy from Amazon, what are the sites that I do go to? And a perfect example of that, I don't know if you've ever heard of sweetwater.com. Uh-uh. Okay, so sweet sweetwater.com is uh, the biggest e-commerce site in the world for musical instruments, for anything music related, right? If you're a musician, you've bought something from sweetwater.com. And the reason, you know, they go have been so successful is I think it goes back to everything you just said there. You know, when you contact Sweetwater, 
uh, and you buy something from them, you're assigned a rep. That rep is a musician. He's passionate about it. They, you call them up. They will help you because uh, they have expertise and they create community and they push out content. And, um, you know, I guess the bright side of listening to this for everybody sort of starting out looking at the the Amazons and they're feeling like David here and the David and Goliath, it, it's – there's always going to be that future in terms of subcategories. Now, uh, I guess the question is, is, is how deep will these subcategories go? Well, that's, that's a challenge. But before we get that, let me just mention quickly a couple of other techniques people can look toward. Hmm. Um, and, and the one is to have a higher purpose. You know, Casper, the successful mattress company, they really are concerned with sleep. Yeah. Amazon selling mattresses. Casper is going to help you sleep. Um, and then there's a personal touch. I mean, have you ever tried to call someone at Amazon? You can't oh, do it. Yeah, no. But all these other sites, a, a real person is probably three seconds away. Mm -hmm. And then there's the idea of being a feisty underdog. Uh, and that's the that's sort of in at least in America, the best brand position you can possibly be in if you can have that opportunity. And Amazon is never going to be a feisty underdog. And and finally, uh, you know, Amazon has low prices, but one of the things you can do is position yourself against storefronts, and that's what Dollar Shave Club does. They they don't say we have lower prices than Amazon. What they say is we have lower prices than your corner drugstore. Mm -hmm. It's as if Amazon doesn't exist. Yeah. And so, uh, so you can turn things like a prime and, and the low price of Amazon. Um, you can handle that by ignoring it and, and position it against something else. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that was just a, another. You know, what was your question again? I don't recall what the question was now. <laughs> but that's I, okay. I, uh, I, I that that's okay because that was that was fantastic. Well, I know what it was. It was something about how do you know if a subcategory is oh, yeah, uh, yeah 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 is, is going to be uh, viable? Yes, and yeah. that's just a huge, hugely good question, and uh, it's like any other innovation, uh, whoever. Uh, is behind it is sort of really involved, maybe professionally involved and, uh, and enthusiastic about it. Mm -hmm. And so you, you have to step back and, and be uh, rational because if you take every idea and, and sort of label it as a new subcategory and it really isn't, you're going to uh, you know, waste a lot of precious sort of risk dollars. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and so uh, you really have to do some, uh, uh, some research. And of course, these days, what research, uh, the ultimate research these days is uh, just try it out in the marketplace, Sure. even if it's a, an inferior version of this and start to learn about who's interested, uh, how would they use it, and so forth. And uh, uh, it, if you're lucky, these early versions will mushroom quickly, mm -hmm. and uh, then you then it's easy. If you're not lucky and you're more conventional, then you're going to have to improve it, improve it, improve it until it reaches a point where mm -hmm. it's really viable. Um, and so you do have to be careful about being over optimistic about something and unrealistic. And uh, you know the 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 was the segue this this um device that you you stand on and yeah. you can you yep. go through the shopping center and so on yeah i mean people like bill gates were projecting this is going to be the next automobile yeah and they yep. were they were creating factories to create a half a million of these in the first 10 years i think they sold a, a much a smaller a share of that and it turned out that um they're their prime market, it wasn't their only market, but they were gonna sell it to policemen mm -hmm. and to uh, mail carriers. Well, it turned out that mail carriers needed two hands. They, they 
and they also needed to operate in the rain. Right. And, uh, and policemen would rather have bicycles that didn't run out of gas. <laughs> and, uh, and so the, these two markets weren't very uh, low and, and this company was not run by marketing branding people. It was run by uh, people that are really good at creating this wonderful product that was extremely reliable and it lived up to its promise. But uh, it never, never sold anything. So, um, yeah, it, it's 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 uh, one of the one of the challenges. So, uh, you know, in your position, especially with the agency and profit and stuff like that, you work with a lot of different companies. How often do you find companies where the product creator was also uh, good at the marketing side, or is that something that you see very? segmented most of the time well i think if you look at startups yeah uh, startups is uh, uh you know they're they're solving these short-term critical problems which are often uh, technical and operational mm -hmm. and so they absolutely have to have those people and uh in marketing and branding is not very well understood mm -hmm. and uh and sometimes there's not not enough resources to uh, to access good people, but more than that, to support any kind of a branding and marketing program. The other problem with startups is that, you know, your brand's going to probably change every six months for a while. Yeah. So if you invest too much money in a brand position, um, you know, you, you, it, it's going to be wasted unless you're very clever about the way you do it. I mean, take Amazon. What if Amazon had been called books.com? You know, at the time Amazon came out, people thought that the name was a liability. It should have been books.com. Yeah. Because they were selling books over yeah. the internet. That's yeah. their business. And and they called it Amazon. And, and I don't know if that was lucky or really strategic, but uh, it turned out that if it were books.com, they would have had to made a very expensive rebrand risky name change. Yeah, no, that's true. That's true. Um, okay. So that said, um, one more question for you. And that's something that I read in your book. And uh, that was in terms of brand leadership versus brand preference. And, you know, it, it, it sounds a little nuanced at first, but there seems to be, there's a big difference there. And uh, can you explain that to the listeners? What, when you say brand leadership wins over brand preference, what are we talking about there? Why does it matter? Well, I really talk about brand relevance over brand preference. Okay. I think uh, um, brand relevance means two things. It means visibility and credibility. Okay. So if you're going to buy a, uh, an, an electric car, uh, what brands come to mind? I mean, and maybe a, Tesla. a Cadillac just doesn't come to yeah. mind. I mean, even though you know the Cadillac name, it's very familiar to you. When you buy an electric car, you just don't think about it. Mm -hmm. And so many times companies have a, a really envied brand position within some category, but in a subcategory emerged, they, they don't have visibility and credibility, even though they've got a really, really strong brand. So that's, that's, uh, can be frustrating and puzzling to people. They've got this strong brand by all kinds of measures and their, and their sales are falling. Mm -hmm. And, and it, it might be that they make, uh, you know, uh, uh, they, they make uh, wagons and, and people are now buying uh, SUVs. So even though they got a strong brand, people are now buying something else that they, uh, they're not perceived to be relevant. Mm -hmm. They're not perceived to be relevant and credible for that subcategory. And so that's what you, where you see dynamics in the marketplace where, where brands ironically remain really strong um, they really have good high preference. People will buy no other brand. People will tell their neighbors, this is the greatest um, 
van uh, that I've ever, minivan that I've ever had. I wouldn't buy any other minivan. You got to buy this minivan. But if they're not buying an SUV, it, it doesn't matter. And so your sales are going to go down even though your brand is stronger than it's ever been because people aren't buying minivans anymore. They're buying SUVs. Mm -hmm. So you have to somehow create a new SUV brand or you have to make your minivan brand be relevant in the SUV market. Right. Neither of those are easy to do. And, uh, and especially if you, if you figure this out late in the game, when, when a quarter of your, your market has already migrated to SUVs. Uh, right. and, and these other people have a lot of energy. These new SUV brands have a lot of energy and uh, momentum. Uh, so anyway, my, uh, my general take, and it's related to this subcategory book, is that even if you're not the one creating the subcategory that will fuel growth, you've got to be aware of what's happening in the marketplace. And if some competitor is created a subcategory that's going to feel growth, you've got to realize that some of your customer base is going to find your brand still strong, mm -hmm. still preferred, but irrelevant. Right. And, uh, and so you, you have to keep on top of those dynamics. So, you know, I think this is... The example you just gave there with the electric cars is a perfect example of a new category that um, for all intents and purposes, I think Tesla has pioneered that and is yes. the strongest brand hands down. I've got a Tesla sitting in my garage. And, and, te and Prius had a hell of a run as the yeah. exemplar brand in the hybrid market. So, and, and therein lies one of the questions I've always had is how did Tesla get so far ahead of Toyota when Toyota has had this amazing almost there for the longest time. And do you think that the big automotive companies have moved too slow or do you just think they're waiting for Tesla to, you know, do the hard work and then they're just going to swoop in with their big supply chain? And Well, it turns out that uh, <clears throat> almost never is the pioneer, the, the, uh, the emerging market leader almost never happens. You take a Prius, for example, which was a remarkable case of somebody creating a subcategory and owning it for a dozen years. And uh, they had like 60, 70% share of that subcategory mm -hmm. for so long. And, and you know who made the first hybrid? It was Honda. Two years before, uh, Toyota's Prius came out two years. Honda right. had a hybrid, and and but Prius came, he Prius got it right. Yeah, uh, and and two years later, Prius uh, uh, got the name right, got the design right. Honda had a uh, put their hybrid in a car that was identical to the to the uh, the conventional car. Yeah, it just one had a hybrid engine and and one didn't. So it was going down the street and you couldn't tell if it was a hybrid or not. Mm -hmm. But with the Prius had a distinctive design, you saw a Prius, you were driving a hybrid. So sure. these people who wanted to save the world, they wanted to be a hybrid owner. If they bought a, a, a Honda, they weren't, uh, now nobody knew. Right, yeah. If they bought a Prius, they knew. And then Prius had all this, this uh, you know, not major, but minor advances. Every two years, they would add some new innovations to it. Mm -hmm. uh, so anyway, I think that uh, it, it really depends on, uh, Steve Jobs is really good at timing. He didn't come out with products prematurely. Yeah. He kind of waited and the technology was there. And then he put products on the, on the ground that really uh, that really worked. That happened with iPod, it happened mm -hmm. with iPad, it happened with iPhone. The, he was not the first in any of those three things. Um, Sony was out two years before iPod. Microsoft was out years before iPad. Yeah. Uh, and there was all kinds of iPhones before iPhone, but Apple was the first to get it right. So that that's interesting because you know a lot of people perceive Steve Jobs as uh, you know, as a category creator, right? He created the smartphone. He created the, the uh, you know, the music in your pocket type thing. 
but from what you're saying, he didn't. He just timed it better and waited. Yeah, he had a good feel for the technology. Yeah. And his instinct was, you know, technology is now ready. Uh, yeah. and, and, and Microsoft and Sony, they were premature. Mm -hmm. They put out products that, uh, that, that weren't ready. The, the, the iPod Sony put out couldn't play very many songs. It was expensive. Yep. And, uh, and so Steve, I think, well, he's, got a, he's a real genius on several levels. He's also not a very nice person. On several <laughs> levels, there was but, that. <laughs> uh, there was that. And, and then he gets in what makes a great CEO and you ask him, how does Bobby Knight win so many basketball games and Steve Jobs innovate seven times over but uh, and that's a tough question for the guys that like under the illusion that only good guys can run companies but yeah that's a, a, a I digress <laughs> but anyway uh, um, yeah it, he he was he was a genius at timing yeah yeah, no, that makes sense. Um, which which isn't how he's perceived. He's perceived as the as the creator, as as the visionary. When in reality, that may not be the case. Well, look, yeah, he took off the shelf technology in all cases. Yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Um, okay, so just before we wrap up, last question for you. I mean, you know, we've been talking about Amazon. We live in this this place where we have some really dominant players in uh and it it feels like consolidation is happening in numerous different areas where bigger is getting bigger and uh where do you see it in let's say a decade from now in terms of the opportunity for the small guys are those subcategories always going to exist is there always going to be opportunity for the new guys i think so i and i think that Amazon, I, I don't know, maybe it'll still have a high percentage of the market, but the market's going to expand and there's going to be opportunities for people that can uh, can exploit these these uh, weaknesses of Amazon. And uh, hopefully the government will take away their cloud computing subsidy. And and uh, but there's going to be opportunities for the feisty arm dog, the, the humorous personality, the the person would they develop credibility within a subcategory that can develop a, therefore a simpler choice at for you and uh and uh and can develop uh, a passion for a subcategory like you said musical instruments or, or beauty products or, or something that uh, will develop a following that can support a pretty big business so what do you think the chances are i mean I've been watching this. I've been in the tech space for now over 20 years. I've watched these guys get bigger and bigger. I've listened to the uh, people talking about monopoly and antitrust and all of that. Um, I, you know, I see these CEOs now, they get paraded in front of a bunch of politicians. The politicians try and make them look bad. They ask a bus bunch of questions. Proposals are put forward. Proposals never actually make it anywhere. Do you think it's going to happen? You think they're well, gonna I, I think that I, um, I think that Amazon is going to have to be broken up, and so the cloud computing will will go away. But uh, you know, in the grand scheme of things, that's that's only a part of the problem. And yeah. uh, and our antitrust laws right now are not really set up to deal with this situation. No, not at all. Uh, that, that's that's where I think the laws need to be updated. I mean, they were they, they these are the antitrust laws they used, you know, a hundred years ago. Um, this is a very different time and place. I mean, I I hope I hope it does. And you know, from all the the reading and studying I've done, anytime a big company has been broken up due to antitrust, it increases shareholder value as those split off and continue to to grow and prosper on their own. So. Yeah, it wouldn't hurt Amazon to get rid of the cloud or break off cloud computing. It would for the stockholders. It would probably be a good thing. Yeah. But uh, 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 yeah, it, it just I think that the fact that they can use cloud computing to subsidize their e-commerce business is is so unfair and yeah. such an egregious use of market power that. Yeah. Um, and I think that can be done under existing laws. 
Yeah. But I'm no lawyer. I'm no lawyer. No, I know. I know. We're all sitting on the armchair quarterbacking it, hoping for the best. But uh, yeah, I hope something happens. Well, look, David, I've really enjoyed, I've really enjoyed this guy. I could talk to you for, for days. I would love to just, just get inside your brain. There's so much knowledge in there. Um, but we don't have that time. So where, uh, where can we find out more? Where can we connect with you online? Where should our listeners go? Well, the, my vehicle is mainly my books. This, this book you mentioned, uh, mm-hmm. game-changing subcategories. And my other recent book is called Creating Signature Stories. And that's a topic for another day. But the idea is that the only way to break through with all this cluttered media and information overload is with stories. Yes. And uh, so that's how you need to talk about brands these days. And uh, so those books are the primary vehicle. I do have a blog, Acheron Branding, mm-hmm. that uh, I talk about a lot of the issues of the day. And uh, um, so, but anyway, my prime vehicle is really the books. And and uh, uh, and I give talks on these things too. And, and you can view them on YouTube if you want. Oh, good. Excellent. All right. Well, David, thank you so much for uh, taking the time to be here today. Yeah, well, my pleasure. Thanks for having me. All right, everybody. And uh, now it's uh, now it's your turn. The only way the stuff that we talk about here makes a difference in your life and your business is if you actually do something about it. Uh, it's not about taking a test and passing after. It's about actually gleaning information, applying it to your business. So what is your subcategory? How are you going to differentiate yourself? Think about that. And if you learned something here today, please take a moment, leave us a rating or review on your favorite podcast platform. And this episode's a wrap. We'll see you next time. Thanks for listening to another info-packed episode of the Project Ignite podcast with Derek Gale. Any links mentioned, along with an entire transcript of this episode, can be found at projectignite.com slash podcast. And to make sure you never miss another episode, go to iTunes or SoundCloud now and subscribe.